Hi, everyone. This is Evan Shapiro, your host for Streaming Media Connect. Um, welcome to our next panel, which is Sportsbook Streaming, Microbetting and Other Factors Driving Ultra Low Latency Streaming. Before we get into the panel with our excellent host and panelists, um, I want to remind you that we're giving away a $50 Amazon gift card in every panel. Um, you have to be here at the end of the session order, in order to win. You also have to be the first who's still there who gets the right name of song and the band who created the music you were just listening to. So put that in the chat. And if, you, you're, not, if you're not first, maybe someone, someone got it wrong or they won't be here at the end, but everyone's going to be here because this is going to be a riveting panel. Um, put your chat in the chat, put your guesses there, put other comments there. But at the end, about 15 minutes before the end of this panel, um, our moderator is going to throw to Q&A and there should be Qs in the Q&A. If there are no Qs, there will be few A's. That's just how it goes. So try to put your chat in the chat and your questions in the Q&A. Um, just a reminder that all the sessions from today and all three days of Streaming Media East are going to be on Streaming Media's YouTube page next week. The link is in the chat right now. Um, I want to thank our sponsor for this uh, panel um, on uh, um, sports book streaming. Um, their name is Nano Cosmos, which because it's sports book and sports oriented, I think of tiny soccer players, but that's just me. I want to throw it to our great uh, moderator for this, Jason Tebow from Streaming Video Technology Alliance. Jason? Yo, Evan, thank you so much for that intro. I need, I need some intro music, like it's like, it's like boxing music. All right, everybody, hello, welcome. Uh, Jason Tebow, everyone calls me JT, the executive director of the Streaming Video Technology Alliance. We are here to talk about ultra low latency and micro betting, some really cool topic right now. Uh, it's hot, it's exciting. Um, if you're in for it, we're running a live stream simultaneously with this on FanDuel where we are doing buzzword bingo. So you can guess on the propensity of us to say things like circle back around, WebRTC, um, and you can place bets on those, and hopefully somebody will get really rich at the end, if only I was serious. But anyway, let's talk about that whole use case. So let's introduce, uh, let's get to introduce our panelists here. Uh, we've got three panelists that are joining us, uh, real experts in this space, both from the technology and the sort of business side of the house. Um, we'll let them talk about themselves a little bit before we jump into questions. And just to remind you, somewhere around like the, you know, 10 minute mark at the end, we'll be turning over to audience questions. So if you've got something that you wanna ask uh, these great panelists, uh, definitely keep that in mind and we'll hopefully get to that uh, near the end of, of the session. So with that said, uh, why don't we start off with introductions and we'll, uh, we'll kick off with Darcy. Hey, good to be here, Jason. Uh, Darcy Lorenz, I'm currently the uh, Chief Technology Officer at Barrett Jackson. I'm also uh, the chairman of the board for a company called WT Fast on the latency side of gaming and uh, had a few decades in, in streaming. So be able to hopefully put some of that experience into words for the audience today. Awesome. Thanks, Darcy. All right. Uh, Oliver. Hello, everybody. Happy to join this discussion. I'm Oliver Leeds, founder and CEO of NanoCosmos based in Berlin. We, um, our product is NanoStream Cloud, an ultra low latency live streaming platform at a global scale. We're working in several industries, uh, enterprise, town hall, but also gaming and betting. So that's why I'm here and uh, looking forward to discussing these topics. Fantastic. And uh, last but not least, Rob. Hello, uh, thank you for uh, having me on the panel. Uh, my name is Robert Reinhardt. I'm from VideoRx. I am a consultant uh, first and foremost, but I do lead teams to build out solutions for the clients that come to me. Uh, I work with government and Fortune 500 companies alike, uh, currently working on uh, projects with the National Institutes of Health um, and uh, helping people build out uh, FFmpeg uh, uh, workflows. All right, and just an update, I've already won $47 in the micro betting that we have running on FanDuel. Yeah, only that was the case. Uh, all right, let's jump into this. So there's, this is, you know, I, I get talked a lot about and sort of the role that I play uh, with the SVTA, and we got to talk to a lot of the industry. Um, and, and ultra low latency is hot, right? People are talking about it for an obvious use case, which is betting, right? So you can't have any lag or latency whatsoever when you're talking about placing bets on something that is happening in real time. So um, you know, Oliver, maybe you can you can start us off with an answer to this first question. But 
you know, like I just said, micro vetting use cases, they need, they need ultra low latency, sort of, sort of a, a must have. Um, but what is that really? What is ultra low latency? And then what's really required to provide it at scale? And then of course, Darcy and, and Rob jump in, you know, after, uh, after Oliver. Yeah, sure. Let, let me start with the latency question. So uh, we consider ultra low latency sub one second which is mandatory for betting, gaming, and auctioning use cases because you need to be as close to real time as possible. And not only um, for the streaming technology, but you really need to have su successful playback at all participants anywhere in the world. So that's um, an additional challenge on top of the technology for the, for the video itself. Just needs to play everywhere. You need to be available everywhere. Everybody needs to have a running stream, which can be whatever low bit rate stream, 100K, 200K even, um, so the, the, the diversity between whatever a HD leanback scenarios like you are used, used in TV and OTT scenarios and these betting scenarios where you have a much smaller video, you have the additional betting elements uh, on the screen, you preferably are working on a mobile phone. So that's all different. So the use case is a bit, a bit different. And it's um, kind of the traditional betting things on, on games, but also the in-game in betting, which is the micro betting which happens during the game, which needs to be real real time. And uh, that can be also not only the uh, traditional games like sports, uh, large sports events, but also new new types of applications which are created around sports and uh, the idea of gamification uh, where you be part of an uh, event where you can bet on, which can be a separate tournament scenario, uh, things like also several companies are setting up their own kind of leagues for sports betting, which could be basketball, uh, soccer, football, whatever. I, I just uh, ran into a kind of table tennis scenario, which is also um, uh, added value with uh, the, um, live graphics where the ball is shown and you can get some statistics out of that and you can then bet on the next um, round. So that's all very interesting scenarios. And there are a lot of innovations going on in this area, which go beyond the just stream the OTTs uh, to content and create some some new applications around these ideas. Oliver, I mean, sorry, Darcy or Rob, anything to add to that? Uh, I'll jump in. Um, I think the definition of what ultra low latency is can, uh, particularly to micro betting in that sphere, and this was talked about at Stream Media East in Boston just a few months ago, but uh, is really the context of what the event is and how it's being broadcast out on different channels, right? Because you only, if, if there's latency everywhere, then you want those latencies to be somewhat identical to each other. So if a satellite feed, uh, a satellite feed could have a greater latency than, uh, than uh, WebRTC could have or any other um, uh, technology to de deploy it. So I think whatever the mechanism is that allows you to bet has to be in sync with what everyone else can use to bet with it and how they're going to get their information for it. Clearly, if, you know, you, you know, with sports, you could have someone in the audience that could be informing someone if, like, you know, elsewhere, like, hey, this just happened. And, you know, you could probably work out a system where if you didn't have your latencies all lined up where people could cheat. Um, and that's what you potentially want to avoid, right? Or mm -hmm. I, I should <laughs> say potentially. You definitely want to avoid people being able to cheat in a micro betting scenario so that they can't win with prior knowledge. And so... Uh, obviously, the, the easiest way to do that is to just make sure keep latency as low as possible, right? And just keep that consistent across all of your delivery devices. Anything to add there, Darcy, from, from your experiences with Bear Jackson and auctions? Well, there's been plenty of companies that have tried to normalize the latency across different inputs and outputs. And uh, I think the challenge is still going. But you know, if you're consuming under a milli, you know, a second, uh, chances that satellite's going to beat that are pretty slim to none and same with broadcast. So I think, you know, streaming's kind of leapfrogged over those uh, other mediums. And I think that's the standard for the lowest latency today, obviously. Yeah. And I've, I've, it's interesting. I've had conversations with some, with some big um, sort of live sports, we'll call them broadcasters. Um, but what they've started to do is bifurcate their architectures, right? So they're giving HLS to the folks that are not betting, and as soon as somebody wants to start betting, they switch over to a WebRTC feed. So you're not overburdening your WebRTC infrastructure with the scale of everybody because 
um, you know, WebRTC is going to require specialized media servers, not just an HTTP server. So you're going to have to have different infrastructure and that's a scale issue. And so I've, I've, I've heard a, a number of sports broadcasters talk about this sort of bifurcated uh, workflow, but that leads us actually into our next question, which is about WebRTC, right? We, we've, <laughs> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I know that somebody right now is betting on me on how many times I can say WebRTC. So the question we often hear <laughs> about WebRTC is about WebRTC being used WebRTC for cases like live WebRTC streaming, where Web, WebRTC micro betting is WebRTC needed. There, so, okay, that person's really happy. I've just blown the odds out of the water and they want a bunch of money. Um, so, you know, Rob, maybe you can answer this for us first. Is WebRTC the only option available for ultra low latency streaming? You know, like we got LLHLS and low latency dash and some other stuff. Give us, give us your thoughts. Uh, I, my, my short answer to that is no, it doesn't need to be WebRTC. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, but there's a lot of, uh, you know, maybes and buts in there too, right? Because uh, uh, again, it really depends on what how those your audience is inter interacting with that event and and uh, what the time frame is they have to react to it um, the uh, you know there's there's different ideas around mic micro betting and how it's implemented you know there's like uh, the time to react and place the bet as well as the scale of the bet right like how much money are you betting versus you know um, um, how much you're not uh, the I would say, um, you know, and just to throw uh, Oliver a bone here with NanoCosmos, WebSockets is a perfectly fine uh, technology. There's other vendors in that space like Vindrol and uh, that are doing WebSockets as well. Um, and um, all anyone who's in that space of trying to scale ultra low latency knows that there's a lot of problems with WebRTC, right? I mean, uh, there's firewall issues, uh, especially if you want to use a mobile device, you might have um, inter um, uh, transport issues with WebRTC on, on, depending on what kind of network you're on, whereas um, things that can just punch through uh, most firewalls without a problem, like WebSockets, uh, you're not going to have that connectivity issue off the bot, uh, off the bat. Uh, I would also say that, um, we've advanced to a point now where data synchronization can happen very quickly outside of streaming in, in, in general, right? And so uh, if we're talking about a data layer where, you know, transaction is happening, that definitely doesn't have, have to happen over WebRTC. And a lot of, uh, I've seen scenarios, not necessarily in micro betting, but where real-time transactions have to happen. WebRTC might be there for AV, but they might be using something else for the data transaction, right? Like a WebSocket or something else. So there, there, there are variations that will work. Um, and again, if synchronization is more important, like the audience is all on the same page, regardless of latency of what's actually happening in the real event, then you have a number of options there. Uh, I know the livery, for example, has their own custom CMF um, manifest that will align data uh, and, and deliver it very consistently across live presentations and events. So um, there, there's other options out there for sure. Lover? Yeah, I agree that um, we don't need WebRTC for all use cases. We also don't use it for delivery. Um, it is a valid technology for certain use cases. Uh, Rob already described the challenges in scale, etc., firewalls. Um, it also has some challenges in adaptive bitrate playback scenarios, which uh, doesn't adjust so well. So if you have network congestion, you run into the same issues you have everywhere, like uh, in traditional streaming. And uh, so that's why we purposely decided not to use that for delivery. We use HTTPS based delivery. And there are new technologies which are emerging like um, Quick and HTTP3, which uh, also are quite promising web transport and all that stuff, which are more uh, meant to be used for large scale distribution. And, but um, I wanna point out that it's not only the technology you need to decide on, it's more like the comprehensive solution you need then because when you, when you want to do something with WebRTC, for example, you have that browser stack, it's available in every browser, but creating a technology and an application around that for distribution is really a big challenge. So you usually need a kind of CDN and partner to which provides the right architecture and and, and uh, components um, to, to have that uh, scalable system already um, in place. Otherwise you just end up to develop, um, create a lot of uh, things you need to develop then. 
So there are a lot of constraints around that, and it's not only the delivery technology. And I was would also maybe connect to the former question again, that um, synchronizing everything in the delivery side, I think it's basically impossible because you would never um, be able to get to real time for broadcast and OTT scenarios. And you don't, also you don't need to. So because you have that lean back scenario, you just want to enjoy the highest quality on your 4K screen maybe. And it's a, just a different use case when you go to real time uh, activities and interaction. They always interact when you do something on a screen, you type something, you have additional um, applications around that. And as you said, um, Jason, that might be a switch from a HLS distribution then to a real time distribution, which is somehow also a usability challenge, but um, that's things which you can differentiate um, to create uh, great usable applications and make that available to your audiences and then monetize it, of course. Yes, absolutely. Darcy, what are, what are your thoughts? I mean, obviously, Fair Jackson is not the biggest car auction, definitely the coolest. Um, you know, how are you guys experiencing, you know, either WebRTC or other protocols with trying to deliver interactivity across the web in real time? Yeah, it's definitely challenging inside of a live event because we're we're trying to uh, keep the lights on and the power and everything else <laughs> at the same time. But uh, multi CDN, you know, we have to go that way all, always. We we haven't found anybody that's uh, singularly going to give us every geography or every uh, thing we need. So I think you know people need to consider more than one CDN, and at least in our case, because uh, you know we can't have our uh, our feed go down. And obviously all the other things that are happening with uh, fantasy bidding and real bidding and other you know micro things happening uh, and data overlays, which we're gonna talk about in a second, all have an impact on the quality of the, the service. Yeah, it's interesting too, is that like when we, you guys keep bringing up these topics like multi-CDN, which, you know, yeah, that makes total sense, but then that brings up a whole host of other issues like that goes to what Oliver was saying in terms of a switch or change happening at the player. So now you have content steering. Which CDN do I send this request to? And how do I manage that? Is it server side? Is it client side? Is it a bit both? Um, you know, HLS has recently built in content steering into their spec and Dash has as well. And there's now multi-CDN options for players and server side. And it's all of these other little technical considerations jump out um, just because somebody says, we should use multi-CDN, which is the most logical thing somebody could say when you're delivering a live event and you want to make sure everything is resilient and scalable and reliable. It's just, it's, it's, it's very funny. As you sort of peel back the layers of the onion, you keep exposing new challenges that cause concerns. And that actually leads me right into the next question, which Darcy, I'm hoping you can lead us off on this one, but it's about latency, right? So Latency is, I think people are like, oh, you just have this one latency. It's when I push a button and then I get a response and that's it. But there's so much more involved in the streaming workflow. So, you know, given your experience and, and what you guys are trying to accomplish at Bear Jackson, you know, what is the state of latency in real time streaming today for use cases like betting um, and things like that? Are we doing well or is it still sucking? Oh, it's definitely getting better. I mean, I, sa I said I had been here for 30 years in this business, so I can tell you back in the day to compare to now, there's, you know, night and day, but I think we're still making incremental uh, uh, things happen in this business. And everybody that comes in adds is something to the, uh, either it's an investment, you know, from a, from the capital market that creates more bandwidth and more availability, or it's some awareness like gaming, you know, obviously continues to be uh a thing and now we have all these other uh overlays and ar and vr and you name it which are all creating challenges but also opportunities because people want those experiences and they're willing to pay for it. and i guess that kind of comes down to two ends what do we pay for on the contribution side and what do they pay for on the on the last mile where they're consuming because in a lot of cases those are still going to be the, the barrier to having some normalization so i guess that I don't want to jump right to normalization on those other questions there. <laughs> um, but to try to fix that for all those decades, um, we're getting better at it. I think you said, you know, across multi CDNs, and of course now you have a problem because they don't support it in the same way. Uh, but I, I see a world where if we can equalize to the norm, then that's as good as we can get today. And some of the 
people won't be able to participate. That's what you have to actually say is, is it okay that somebody halfway across the world isn't going to be part of the fantasy bid or be a micro betting because they're just too far outside of being able to be uh, equalized, if, if you will. Um, so, and then we all, you know, we have the payload of the content itself. Uh, we have the gameplay happening and it's all happening in that same, you know, player or in that same browser. So there's a lot of load in, in things that we don't control. Um, so we constantly have to look at it, those companies and say, who's better than who, you know, and they're always improving. If, if you want to follow the money, follow betting, you're going to find where probably the most uh, efforts are in terms of solving these problems. That's interesting, Rob. Any any thoughts to add to that? It's such a this is the this is the question of what is the state of latency today. Yeah, it's such an open question uh, and a big question. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I like Darcy. We've been around in this industry for a long time now and seen, you know, we've come a long way. Um, uh, I haven't been in it for 30 years, but uh, 20 years for sure. Uh, well, 24 or five, uh, who's counting now, uh, but in internet, in, 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 in internet, <laughs> in internet years, I don't know what's the multiplier for internet years because it, it's gotta be a, a, a time. Right. Every internet there. year is like that, that's seven right. years in real. In exactly. Real uh, compared to most other technologies. Um, I, I used to joke with uh, students that I taught in university for multimedia that uh, I, I should have stuck with uh, uh, medicine because the human body doesn't change as quickly as uh, technology does. Uh, but the, uh, uh, yeah, we're, we're seeing advance. I, I mean, what's interesting to me, and we just talked about it already with web sockets, is that we can still harness the power and improve upon technologies that have been around that predate streaming. I mean, web sockets have been around for a long, long time. And so it's really, I think, just a matter of, of really thoroughly studying the use case and having the resources put at it that are going to solve it and, and have all the contingencies line up, right? Spe specifically with multi-CDN, right? Because as Darcy said, they're, you know, each one's going to do it a little bit differently. So your playback tech and your, interact your interactive layers all have to be able to switch over over to whatever mode they might need to for that CDN and 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 adapt to it. So I think if I if I'm just going to use that term, the adaptability of latency is getting better, right? We're we're getting closer to standards. WebRTC is one of the closest standards we have that we can work with, and I think that's why it's talked about more than WebSockets because you know NanoCosmos has their own implementation of WebSockets. It's not like and and WebRTC still has a long way to go. I, I've written about it before for Stream Media Magazine. In fact. Um, I powwowed with uh, um, um, the original co-founder of Millicast uh, before Dolby bought it, uh, Dr. Alex, about how, man, it'd be nice if WebRTC had similar uh, frameworks around it that Adobe had for RTMP and uh, that made it consistent, right? I mean, there's... There's a reason why we're still all using RTMP for ingest pretty widely, right? It's an easy standard that became a de facto standard, uh, and and it it, it 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 it's universal. And that's not the same for all these playback techs. So um, I would say the state of latency is still a can of worms because you do have to do so much. I'm hoping five years from now we'll will be better at having maybe some better standards around low latency so that it's not so complicated to have a team of devs build out playback tech that's going to do exactly what you need to do. We now have an over under bet for Rob on five I, years that latency has improved. <laughs> I, I, I did forget to mention, you know, we, we create a lobby for anybody who wants to bet. So we are creating a, an intermediary step. If you're not in the lobby and you're just watching, then you know we don't care. You know, obviously, we care. You have a great experience, but if you're going to bet or you're going to be part of a bidding process, that is in between. So we actually do all of our magic there, not relying entirely on first last mile or the you know the network that we have for that particular location. And that would reduce a lot of the infrastructure scale requirements because yeah. you're going to have only a small portion of your population in that sort of bidding lobby yep. um yeah so oliver what are your what are your thoughts on this latency come on yeah it's, uh, it's of course it's an interesting topic and you can talk hours about that but what we've learned is that um content providers and platform operators just want to achieve uh, their results by providing the content as fast as possible and really to everywhere in the world so 
every remote location is valid and they just want to monetize that all across the globe. And that's really challenging. So when you want to build up that yourself, you have that multi-CDN approach and content steering, which you, which you mentioned, which is possible. But then you have the different CDN providers. You have the player, you have the ingest. You need to, need to decide on all these different protocols and bring that all together somehow. And then what happens if things go wrong? Uh, you need to go to several uh, instances and have a look uh, where the error might come from. So our learning from this and, and what other vendors are also doing is covering, or at least trying to cover the technology in a unified uh, comprehensive solution, which then is made available so you can, and, and the, the uh, content providers can focus on monetizing their content and don't need to worry too much about the video technology. Still, you need to have a proper camera set up, et cetera, and um, provide the right encoder. But that's it then, um, basically. And then the decision is then on the platform, platform provider to provide the right um, service level. And what is usually expected nowadays is 100% SLA. So that's that's why we are all talking about um, content steering and multi-CDM, that if anything fails, it automatically fails over, switches to secondary distribution, et cetera. And that's things which um, I think which makes sense to be covered in a in a platform which which covers all that and then which lets um, covers the decision which protocol to use and which device etc. And that um, a bit to make it more usable. No, absolutely. I mean, at the, at the SVTA, we have a you know a live streaming working group that actually put out a paper about best practices and live stream latency. Sort of what and what they discovered was just late up and down the workflows. So many little points that can cause more latency, which can impact use cases like micro bedding. Even if you're using WebRTC or WebSockets or HTTP3 or media over quick, it doesn't matter if your upstream workflow is congested with latency at various spots, you're going to get latency from the camera from glass to glass, right? It's, it's sort of unavoidable. Um, one of the interesting use cases I've heard for reducing latency is actually in arena bedding. Um, and so we're starting to see a lot of the U.S. arenas, and I think there are some in Europe as well, that are getting lit up with 5G ultra-wideband. And so once you have the 5G ultra-wideband, you're in this enclosed environment. The people watching the match on their phone, at the same time they're there because they want to see different camera angles or they want to place bets. And so now you have this perfect sort of petri dish, if you will, of a place to offer micro-betting because you do reduce some of that last mile latency that, you know, to be honest, the only people that can control that are the network operators. Um, so it's, I've, I've heard this use case quite a bit. It's, it's actually really interesting. I've, I've yet to see, I think, to see it really play out at a big scale. Um, but I know that that's something that a lot of the betting folks are excited about in terms of having some sort of captive audience that can that can do micro betting. Um, Oliver, I'm going I'm to ask you the, the sort of this follow-up question uh, based on what you were talking about. So, you know, obviously... Latency is a problem, right? It is a problem that needs to be addressed. It's it's sometimes going to be great, sometimes bad. You can do a lot of dial, you know, knob turning and clip switching to get it better. But that's not the only technical challenge for supporting use cases like micro betting. So can you talk a little bit about what your thoughts are and sort of what are some of the other technical challenges that uh, a provider of micro betting might face in addition to latency? Yeah, that's connecting to what I just said, um, to have the full infrastructure, that you have the ingest platform, the ingest locations available as close to the uh, event, but also the uh, playout locations. So you need a CDN, which covers the network, which makes things available uh, without any hiccups. And then you need to have, um, of course, the availability, but also some insight on the transport. So there are always cases when things go wrong. So you have network congestions anywhere on the workflow part of the audience might get uh, whatever lower quality, and et cetera. And you need to identify where it's coming from. So is it coming from the camera, from the ingest? Is it coming from in the, from the middle mile, from the CDN? Or is it coming from the last mile from the to the end user? And to get that inside, you need some metrics and uh, correlate that somehow on an analytics platform. So that's also what vendors are more and more providing and uh, integrate into their platforms um, to um, enable more transparency and give more insight into the quality of service. It's not only the latency, but also the buffering, video quality, et cetera, for every user out in the world. And um, things like security, we probably also touch then, uh, which is uh, also part of the game. We are going to talk about that. Absolutely. Security is definitely a big concern. Rob, what are, what are your summer thoughts on some of the other technical challenges of, of enabling these kinds of 
you know, use cases like micro vetting? Um, I think vetting, uh, it, it was really brought up, but it's, it's been in the back of my mind ever since it was brought up, uh, is just vetting the connection that the person has right, right away. Like, cause not, not Darcy brought it up, like not everyone may be able to partic participate based on what they have. Right. And I think, um, not, that's not an answer. Uh, stakeholders want to hear that there's going to be a limitation <laughs> potentially of people who can participate. But, you know, they're, they're, uh, as this industry grows, uh, there's going to be a lot of money involved in it. And you don't want to necessarily, you know, have things go wrong. And so I, I think uh, um, uh, Darcy mentioned in the lobby, it made me start thinking about even, um, even when I was building out uh, years ago, just AV solutions that had to be real time before Zoom and other uh, uh, conferencing software solutions were out there, we would always have to vet whether or not someone had the bandwidth to even push video, right? And if you couldn't, then sorry, you, you're not going to be able to even try to turn on your camera, right? It won't even be an option to turn on the camera. Um, I remember one of the first... Um, streaming players that I built with broadcast when I uh, was VP of multimedia applications at schematic was for uh, ABC's first full episode streaming player. That was when lost and desperate housewives was about. And uh, they specifically didn't want to have anything under 800 kilobits. And that was a long time ago, right? I mean, uh, an 800 kilobits was a pretty high bar for the lowest common denominator, right? And they, the player would just say, sorry, you don't have enough bandwidth to even support our lowest quality. You're not going to be able to uh, participate in this. So I only use that as a comparable to what I think is, uh, you know, going to be interesting when it comes to uh, just how successful micro betting uh, becomes integrated in, in greater environments. I, I, I really think what you brought up uh, just an earlier, uh, um, 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 uh, sorry, Jason, not Justin. I, your T and your tibble. I, I know. I know. I get called Richard all the time, so you can call me Richard if you want to get back at me. Uh, but the uh, that's right. There you go. Uh, well, you brought it up, Jason, earlier with the the five uh, G Ultra Band. That I think we're gonna. I think that's gonna be the first nice big step, right? I know Phoenix has been partnered partnered with Verizon with the multi camera views with uh, Verizon in state, you know, at stadium events. So I think that. That makes a lot of sense to me because you're removing a whole lot of uncertainty there. If everyone has the same last mile connection, then you're going to have a, a lot of guarantee behind what's happening there. So, um, and I think when it comes to the greater audience and the greater global audience and whatever internet connection they might have, uh, you know, and, and that's just it. I mean, even our 4G and 5G connections aren't static. I can move in this house and my connection's going to change, right? So like, like you know, and that, and I think that that's... It, it, as a developer myself, a, a coder, I know that one of the most overlooked uh, areas of development tends to be in error detection in general or error handling. And so, you know, just because you were vetted at the beginning of an experience doesn't mean that you're going to be good throughout the experience and that you can you have to continually check in with that client to make sure that they're still satisfying all the conditions that you initially had going in, right? So, um, and those are the kind of dotting your I's and crossing your T's that I see overlooked, uh, usually with smaller scale projects where they're trying to enter into the foray of, 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 uh, of building out solutions that require more resources to be successful with it. Darcy, any, any thoughts to add to that? Gaming has really changed the game for us. Uh, what you were just saying about real-time measurement of everybody that's in a session, uh, you know, every millisecond, as much as you can do. So even if they're moving around their house, you still know the conditions and they fall outside of the rules, then you, they get disconnected or you have to give them a message. But I do like 5G. I think, you know, it takes first and last mile and middle mile and everything and puts it into one technology band doesn't mean it's great yet but it you know when we see gamers playing uh, and they're connected to a verizon or at&t or singtel uh, 5g uh, network it, then there is no well you know there's no cpe in the home that's creating some latency the other thing i i can tell you that uh encryption is a is a bugger when it comes to uh you know and that and of course privacy and security and everything comes in when you're when you're talking about money 
So when you add encryption in, now you got a whole other layer of stuff to worry about and depends on who the provider is. So you still have a lot of things happening, but I still like the idea that we're going to have some homogenous network and we've got enough network touch points now we can measure things in real time as well as deliver in real time. So I think it's getting better and gaming has, has made all that happen. Every one of these tournaments that happens in these remote gamers and there's millions of dollars on the line, uh, we had to figure that stuff out. And we're just seeing more of that gaming technology become more of the streaming world. And, um, you know, I'm thank God for gaming and all the money and people that are in it. So. No, that's, I mean, that's interesting. And it's, you know, I, I guess we should thank gaming for a little bit for WebRTC, right? So they were using WebRTC for real-time chat and engagement for a long time and made its way into streaming. So thank you, gaming. Um, you know, Darcy, you had mentioned something earlier, and I, I just want to follow up with this about sort of data overlay. You had mentioned, you'd said a couple times sort of mixed reality, you know, AR, um, and and what, what what kind of complications do you think that, that might cause with ultra low latency streaming? Gamification of the experience is the first piece. It, you know, the, the audience for us used to be older folks, so they're satisfied with leaning back and pushing a button to do some fantasy bid or some other transaction. Uh, and now it's, they need more, uh, you know, just that what, what they're actually micro betting on is what the outcome, not outcome anymore. It's what's happening in real time. Is it a pass left or right? Is it going to be, uh, you know, is that car going to be uh, in a, in a game going uh, left or right on a passing on a curve uh, in our world? I mean, things are pretty static in terms of the experience. It's a car sitting on a stage. So, but all the overlays that tell you the data, the statistics tell you the previous 10 cars and the next 10 cars and all the build sheets. And we have overlays coming on our ears. Uh, those are all now being delivered in that same payload. And so they have pressure, uh, but that has to be there in order for to give the user experience. So they actually have something to, to bet on. Stats is the main driver and stats for us and data, we, we have to overlay it. And it also has to look pretty, it can't just be numbers. It's gotta be in a container and that's graphics. Um, so every one of those things adds a little bit more of the payload and how they consume it, uh, you know, it's interactive too. So they're clicking on things, they're doing things in real time. And it's a lot of web stuff, like you said, oh, web RTC and web AR, and they all have to overlay at the same time and in, in that player. So the browsers have gotten better, uh, so I'm, happy that the browser people woke up a few years ago and if you can pick the right browser at the right time you're you're doing all right but uh yeah i think that the the layers aren't in in a master control it's not a chiron system it's things coming in from all these different data systems and all these overlays and the user themselves having the chat window and doing something on the side that's also consuming their their bandwidth it's all adding to the latency so you have to again, be measuring all those elements within that browser and making sure it all stays within whatever your deliver, delivery window is for time time and, and latency. And we didn't talk about jitter and all the other stuff, but you know it's all it's all there and you it, this was a bear to deal with five, ten years ago. Again, I go back to gaming. it has really solved a lot of it because the gaming networks and the you know twitch and all those things that went out at scale brought a lot of investment into the networks. And uh, we were able, all able to benefit from that. So, um, you know, I think it's going to continue that way, but I think you're just going to see more and more overlays. I'm going to not be wearing the, you know, readers that I'm going to be wearing some overlay glosses that are also tied into my network so I can see overlays in, in this thing. So there's so many things coming at us. Uh, I think, you know, glad that there's smart people have been around a while that are going to be able to help out uh, like the folks on this panel. No, absolutely. You know, so Oliver, you know, obviously, Nano Cosmos, I mean, you guys run a delivery platform, and I say platform because it's more than just a delivery network. Um, what do you guys see in terms of stuff that Darcy was talking about in terms of payloads? Are they increasing as more of your customers are adding immersive, interactive stuff? You know, what are what are your what are you guys seeing? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's uh, actually the typical scenario that you have additional gamification elements which are somewhat generated, computer generated on the screen. And that's also what I mentioned earlier, that you have a lot of room for innovation here. So you can generate new types of application by generating overlays in an um, interactive way, in a usable way to create new types of applications to add these statistics, what Darcy was mentioning, but also like additional information about the players. 
uh, additional gamification elements and um, make some kind of interactive uh, content out of um, existing content. So that's a great uh, opportunity for new application developers to create really new, new applications around existing content and also for the content owners to have additional channels for monetization, which uh, betting is obviously a very good um, good way to monetize uh, your content again. And uh, combining these things with AI, AR, um, VR elements, gamification elements uh, makes the application then interesting to be part of that and take part in the betting scenarios. And let's yeah. all combine all that uh, together and make it available to everybody in the world. It's, it's um, of course challenging, but it's also a great opportunity to create some some new applications around that. I mean, you can almost imagine a scenario where, like what Darcy was saying, somebody's wearing, let's just say AR glasses, they're watching a match at, in live, right? So they're there at the event or the arena watching it live and they're seeing data overlays and they're seeing information on players and they're like, oh, I'm going to bet that that guy, let's say it's a basketball match, that guy's going to, he's going to drive the hoop and slam dunk it. Let's say, you know, so that process right there of doing something with this new interface that may be atypical, it's not on my phone, I don't know, my fingers, it just, it's got other considerations. It'll be interesting to see how these payloads change over time to deal with these newer devices and modalities that are coming out to enable people to do what you just said, Oliver, which is gamify and monetize their content more, right? They, people want to do more with the stuff they have. So it's how, how do I, you know, how do I do that? Um, and one thing I want to return to, and Rob, I've got another question for you right after this. So, um, it, it, but everybody jump in please after this, but it's, you brought it, everyone's brought it up a little bit. It's security, right? So obviously security, ultra low latency, you have to secure that content as much as you have to secure it with, with non real time or sort of, you know, even just low latency stuff via HTTP or something like that. I, I, how do you do this? You know, so Oliver, what, you know, what, are some of the technical considerations to be made when trying to secure content that is being delivered ultra low latency in order to support use cases like microbit? It's a, a more and more important uh, topic we hear from many of our customers um, because you open up the content distribution to, to anybody in the world. So you want to encourage everybody to join. And that means everybody could also be a kind of pirating. Uh, approach and, and misuse the content and that's what what you want to avoid and and that's uh, that's the challenge so it's usually in micro betting and low latency streaming you don't uh, usually use uh, traditional drm scenarios and and technologies it's more like uh, misuse detection kind of um, token based security encryption things which um, create a seamless experience in the application and detecting these kinds of um, attacks and misuse scenarios is, uh, is all, all, always challenging if you don't have the data. So having the right data information from all players, but also from the CDN to be able to detect um, misuse is then uh, very important to lock certain users out uh, who, wanna, who might um, copy the content and misuse it for their own betting scenarios. So because the challenge is there that you also use that for um, uh, gray and uh, whatever non-valid um, betting scenarios, which is happening all around the globe uh, in sports a lot, actually. And uh, that's a great challenge to reduce the, the uh, level of misuse here and that's in these scenarios. Rob, any thoughts on, on security? Yeah, you know, uh, that's, I mean, there's, a, security's got, Again, that, that uh, is this part of your your betting pool right now? Is there a, a, a so many layers to that onion? I don't know if onion well, or is. is <laughs> oh, well, there you go. Um, but uh, there's lots of layers to that, and again, depending on just what the business requirements are going to be around it, um, you know, there. Um, as I think Oliver and Darcy both said it that you know your traditional DRM encryption it may not be enough. 
you may need something that's more than AES-128 encryption around your payloads and um, uh, more layers around it, not just in your transports um, and being secure with your transports, but just how much you're doing to make sure that the data itself is uh, being encrypted to a level. Um, in my past uh, 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 consulting, uh, I brought, I mean, it's not an exact one-to-one, -one, but I have, um, back when Flash clients were uh, popular, I had to, I was hired to audit code to make sure it adhered to state gam um, uh, regulations and that not so much equivalent to micro betting but you know I, I I think micro betting is so new that even from um, a regulation point of view we don't really have a whole lot in place yet it, it's growing uh, and I think it's you know probably uh, it, it's you know, it, it, depending on what side of the fence you stand on there for regulation or not um, Again, there's just not a, a standard set of protocols around just what what it means to be secure and what it means not to be secure, right? Uh, it, 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 it's such a new field that I, every implementation is going to be different. I feel so. And, and Darcy, I mean, as a as a content owner, right? You obviously you have to grapple with this directly. Um, you know, how are you guys addressing security for you know, especially for the, that content that is being used by folks to place bids on auctions? Yeah, it comes back to the lobby. Uh, you know, they authenticate into that during that session. We measure everything, including making sure they're the legitimate person that said who they are, their fingerprint. Uh, trying to train machines to learn for an look for anomalies instead of using DRM in the traditional yeah. ways. Uh, you know, that's a thing today. So we have been doing some of that and looking for patterns that are changing uh, on individuals or on the, you know, during a session. So that's, I think, you know, the machine learning part of things is, is growing fast and being able to throw GPUs uh, out there in the network at problems might, might be saying we're, we're definitely seeing some of that on the quality side for ourselves. And that's the other thing we have to deliver quality at the same time. Nobody wants to bid on a car if they can't see it. So, <laughs> you, you know, you have no option not to show them this, the most beautiful version of that, uh, that car or that vehicle while they're pushing the button up to, you know, millions of dollars. So, you know, somebody comes in and hijacks that transaction, a lot of money can be lost on our side and a lot of people can get angry pretty fast if, you know, they lose that bid or something happens. So we wanna make sure machines learn the patterns of individuals and of the auction in general and look for anomalies in quality, uh, look for anomalies in connection where it's coming from. Encryption, yeah, you know, I don't think it's caught up to the micro stuff we're talking about. Um, so you have to take care of that at that lobby level right now, but I think machines are going to bring it closer to us. Yeah, it's interesting. I know again from a you know since having conversations in the industry, but there's a there was a very disturbing trend by pirates to basically put fake apps in app stores that mimic exactly the legitimate app, and so people would download the mimic app not knowing that they had downloaded a mimic app. They were getting the content they wanted because the pirate was stealing the content into their app. But anything that happened on top of that, subscription, betting, anything, was just going to the pirate. Um, and it's just like, you know, it's kind of what you said. It's, it's, I think all three of you have said this. Really, you have to stay on top of this. You, it's not like, oh, look, it, we just secure it once. We're good. All right. Got that. Check that box. Okay, let's move on to something else. It's like constantly have to address encryption and security like you have to stay on top of having machines do some of that heavy lifting seems like such a natural um, application of that technology. So yeah, um, the, and the bid the bid is a is a transaction, so it's very lightweight. So we're not talking about the you know the whole payload here. That bid button, if something happens there, and it could be just hey somebody hijacked it, um, that, that layer of of your experience. Yeah, they could be bidding and, and send the money somewhere else. So you've just really got to look at those exact. Uh, elements of your experience and say that's the most important element to, and we're not going to watch for anomalies and that's where we're you know applying machine learning right now all right so before we turn to some audience questions we've got a couple i want to i want to talk about one big topic we have not touched on that you guys have all mentioned which is money right so micro betting is about money <laughs> obviously money is changing hands i'm placing a bet i want to win money back chances are i'm going to lose my money but there's still money going somewhere um but obviously there's payment to deal with, right? So in some cases, it might be payment at the time of transaction, might be payment other times. And so Rob, maybe you can you can start us off with this one. 
but how does the choice of payment impact the the latency of the overall experience? And you, again, you're talking sub second, and you've got the process of payment. Does the choice of payment types impact that? You know, what are what are your thoughts on that? Well, clearly, I uh, I. I... You know, and Darcy probably has more uh, uh, current information on this. Uh, I'm doing a lot of experimentation with an R&D group with Lightning payments into real-time transactions because Lightning as a cryptocurrency can uh, be processed way faster than Bitcoin. But it's not the kind of thing that you want to make sure they have the money like while the, they're bidding, right? You, uh, I, you Most of the time you want to make sure that they're – uh, is uh, something there to to be given so that they're you're you're not dealing with people who don't have funds to actually support what they're saying they have and so um, you know um, I know uh, a lot of things I think can work like NFT models where you know like if you're buying an NBA, NBA trading card that's not a micro bet but you can use a credit card to basically buy. In, in some cases it's crypto, but on many, some, a lot of places have their own proprietary point system, right? You buy points that equate to a certain dollar amount and then you are, that way, the vendor who's ever in that, that, that arena can be, you know, using those points uh, on their own data backend without having to involve third parties to confirm whether or not the, that, that currency is available, right? And, um, uh, but I, 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 even though I had the question uh, and I added it to the list, it was more to hear the others on the panel talk uh -huh. about it. So um, I, I want to hear uh, Darcy and uh, Oliver's comments on that. Yeah, let's let's open this up. Let's go to um, let's go to Darcy first, and we'll go to Oliver. Darcy, we're not at a place yet where people show up and it's ad hoc, uh, really, uh, to be honest. So the problem isn't prevalent, but we like to have more people the opportunity to bid or, you know, to have a fantasy bid, which is sort of like play to earn. Mm -hmm. And definitely anything that's digital, it's going to be better than verifying their bank account with a letter and you know, all the other ACH and payment methods that are out there. But that's still the ma majority it is it's pre-verified. Now, that doesn't mean they, you know, you verify in one second and, you know, they took their money out and now they, it's not available. So we have to constantly be cross-connecting with is that a legitimate person is it you know we will check with the bank we'll we'll do we do a lot of checking so when when you register to bid on a car you're not a random person you're you're either known or verified in advance so i guess my my quick answer is we we don't get in that situation in the first place but if we want to make more available to more people especially when we start looking at micro ownership so there is a trend in our business where that car could be owned by a co-op and that co-op mm. can, you know, like in the, if you see in an art right now, it's happening in collector business too. So that's a little more intense because now you got a co-op that has to have validation and there could be a thousand people in that co-op that, or, you know, in that particular car that want to own shares essentially. So you go back to all the, honestly, all the learnings we had in financial markets, you know, and I, I cut my teeth on high-speed training back way back in the day. Um, and that really is that technology. It, and again, it's validating, but it's high-speed trading. And when they when they go within a certain threshold, we'll give some people credit because we know they've been there before. If you're a new person, you don't get as much. So we just have to always know what the boundaries are. But the digital currencies certainly are going to improve a lot of this. Uh, but they're very, they fluctuate very quickly too. So you also have to be aware of what is the value of that thing in that exact moment, not you know in a day or even an hour? That stuff can change so dramatically and it fluctuates so quickly. But I think once you know you've seen probably the news that our government's trying to give us all digital bank accounts these days, and you know unfortunately you know probably going to come sooner than we all like. But I, I like cash still. But when that happens, it's going to take a lot of that drama off the table. But it's also going to create a lot more opportunity for all kinds of you know, shenanigans in the, in the security world. So Absolutely. long way around, long way around, say we don't, we try and stay away from the problem, but it's, it's still there. So. <laughs> the problem, the problem's going to find you. <laughs> Oliver. Yeah, just short because uh, the others said enough, actually um, digital payment is always a challenge and uh, there's no, no solution, which is really seamless. So you need to onboard somehow, you need to log in and authenticate. And there are a lot of vendors trying to simplify that process out there, um, payment processes, be it uh, crypto-based or traditional-based. Um, 
but uh, that's uh, something which which is basically basically usability based and uh, can always be improved. No, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, well then uh, let's turn to the audience questions. We've got a couple of these. Um, so Oliver, maybe you can lead us off with this first one, especially uh, you know again as a delivery platform, you've, you've got a lot of tendrils in, in different regions of the world. You know, so how much is is latency typical in sort of outlier areas outside, let's say the bigger geos, right, or the bigger major metro markets? Um, and are there problems in areas that don't have good access to live streaming? Of course, there are different areas which have reduced bandwidth, etc. But uh, our aim is to provide really sub-second latency everywhere, and um, we try to achieve that by the adaptive bitrate. I also mentioned that we turn quality down then that you still have a valid live stream running and con you can watch the content and be part of that experience. Latency might go a bit up if you have additional challenges like packet loss scenarios, et cetera, but that's uh, still something you can achieve within around one second and stay within the real time limits somehow. Yeah, I know that there's, um, you know, obviously in the US, right? Every country has rural areas where there's not great bandwidth. Um, one of the ways that we've been, that a co companies have been exploring in the US is with ATSC 3.0. So there's um, you can there's a certain way you can turn ATSC three into something interesting called data casting, and so the tower becomes a way to deliver data instead of a television signal. Um, and so the idea is that you would deliver that stream over ATSC three point to TVs or devices that have that are chipped for it, and so you would basically be able to deliver people a much better, higher quality stream via that way than the lousy bandwidth they might have from very limited ISPs and trunk access. So it's, there are some, and then there's obviously satellite, right? Look at Starlink, right? Starlink is supposed to have some amazing low latency. Um, so there, there are definitely ways that are coming around that, you know, CDNs would be using in combination to deliver. So it's um, it's really interesting to see some of the things that are, that are being explored right now to deliver higher quality streams, lower latency to places that don't traditionally have really good access. Um, the other question we have is here, and, and again, um, you know, Oliver, maybe you can leave this off here. And then I definitely want to hear from, from everybody else on this as well is, you know, does piracy, so people pirating live, does that ever affect the latency of the stream for everybody? No, it doesn't typically. So you uh, have some detection mechanisms, like also Darcy was mentioning, you have some uh, AI automation, machine learning, or manual uh, interventions, which you can see to detect some misuse and lock certain clients out. Uh, plus the additional encryption and uh, security options, which shouldn't reduce latency, uh, shouldn't increase latency, of course. So it may might uh, certain encryption um, cycles um, have some turnaround times, which is more in the millisecond range. But uh, as um, all internet traffic is basically encrypted nowadays, or well, HTTPS at least, um, there's no big deal in that. So that's usually not not uh, limiting latency. Anybody else any, want to add to that question? Or even the first one too, you know, just your thoughts on, on you know, delivering higher quality, lower latency stuff to outlying areas or uh, issues of piracy? If not, I have a really cool question to follow on. Let's go cool. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, this is, this is my around the horn question. All right, need a little horn, have you guys up here. It's gonna go around, we'll start with Darcy, go to Richard, oh, let's play this Rob, right? And then, we'll, <laughs> and then we'll end with all of them. Touche. Um, touche. Uh, and here's the question, right? And I love doing this because it um, puts you a little bit on the spot, but it's basically streaming operators coming to you. You're talking about a conversation in a bar, library, deli, coffee shop, whatever. You find out they're a streaming operator and you're like, and they're talking about doing low latency, ultra low latency live streaming. You're going to offer micro betting. What is the one piece of advice you would offer them if they asked that and talked about that, Darcy, go. Piece of advice, uh, I'm a show me guy. So the piece of advice is bring bring the demo. Uh, and and don't, <laughs> don't, 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 don't tell me your story. How many stories I've heard over the years, people solving this problem. Um, so yeah, it's a show me. Uh, and you know, in our world, it, it's easy to do. You just look, plug me into your network and I'm gonna test you against all the other things I've seen. and. And like I said, multi CDN. I'm going to compare you against others, and that's it. I love that. So, so your your advice to the operator, this person's going to have a live stream, is do your testing, make sure you're performing well, awesome. 
Richard go. Oh wait, it's Rob go. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, it, it's probably right in line with Darcy. I was going to use the words due diligence. Just do your due diligence uh, to make sure that your business. I, I say it a lot in all my sessions. Just you know, you got to start with your business requirements and make sure your tech is supporting your business requirements. <laughs> and uh, so many people don't do that. They, uh, you know, uh, uh, especially if they're, they're a small startup or uh, you know, it, it's. Uh, um, just, yeah, uh, right now what I'm doing, uh, for my next feature for stream media magazine is comparing low latency vendors and I'm not, uh, I'm intentionally leaving names out of it and just saying vendor A, B and C based on transport. And, um, it's been very interesting to me just to see, um, how the real life testing comes out. Like just don't, and the, the due diligence is really the, the, the subtext to that is don't trust just what you see in the marketing, right? Because just because someone says they can do something doesn't necessarily mean they can do it or do it as well as you need them to do it. Okay, Oliver. Yeah. Very short, I, I, I would suggest not to try to build a tech stack themselves, but to find the right partner. Ooh, ooh, I like that. I like it. Hmm. Hmm. To who? What partner is Oliver referring? I will leave that for the audience to conclude. Listen, guys, this has been a great panel. It's been really fun. I mean, it's a really important topic. We're going to keep talking about this. I am definitely on the over five years. Rob, sorry. I'm going to make some money on that bet. Uh, but with that said, thank you, Darcy. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Oliver. You guys have been fantastic. And I will turn it back over to Evan. Thank you, Jason, for a great panel. Thank you, panelists. Um, just quickly, Oliver, we did the math. Uh, the furthest distance from Medford, New Jersey, which is the home base of streaming media, uh, is uh, um, Rome is 4,200 miles, Berlin is 3,900 miles. So oh, well. you right now are so in sad. second place for furthest. I know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> so we don't have a winner in uh, Oliver, but we do, we do have a winner. How's that for a segue? Um, uh, on our uh, music uh, trivia question, uh, the, the, the band was Booker T and the MGs. The song was You Keep Me Hanging On. And the winner is Beth Rosen, who has been a stalwart uh, audience member here on Streaming Media Connect uh, this summer. Thank you for that. Uh, Beth, someone will reach out to you uh, about that gift card. Again, thank you to the panelists. Thank you to the tiniest soccer players in the world, Nano Cosmos. Um, and uh, make sure that you stick around for the next panel at, um, well, uh, uh, which is at four o'clock. Sorry, I was just checking the time. Beyond ChatGPT, how AI is transforming stream streaming workflows and businesses. This is going to be cutting edge uh, conversation at four o'clock. Um, just a reminder, all of the panels from all three days of Streaming Media Connect are up on Streaming Media's YouTube page. Link is in the in the uh, uh, chat, and uh, that'll be up next week. Um, and we will be giving yet another uh, Amazon uh, gift card of $50 away in the next panel. So make sure you check it out. See you in about an hour. Again, thank you, panelists. Thank you, Jason. I'll see you in a half an hour. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. <laughs>